I'd like to just begin by introducing the Dean of our law school, uh, Paul Payton, and he is going to give us some welcoming remarks. Thank you very much, Pat. I'll be very brief. My name is Paul Payton. I have the privilege of serving as the Dean of the Faculty of Law. It's my pleasure and honor to welcome you here for an important dialogue and discussion. And I wanted to offer congratulations to Pat and the Center for Constitutional Studies for yet another event that I think is critically important in terms of the life of the law school in the broader community. We are a public institution and fostering legal education, broader education, dialogue, discussion, and debate is part of our mandate. And one of the things that I'm very proud of with this and so many other events is that we are actually serving the public good by training future lawyers, by engaging in constitutional analysis and research, in disseminating that research, and in fostering dialogue. So very proud of what the work, the work that Pat and the Center is doing. Really wanted to welcome and thank you for attending this afternoon. I think with the number of students here, both from the law school and elsewhere in the university, and so many members of the, the broader community, it's an important validation of so many directions that this law school has taken for so many years and is taking uh, with your assistance as we move forward. So welcome, thank you. Uh, I'll turn it back over to Pat. Congratulations on a immediately very successful event. Well, all right, so just before I begin by introducing our panel, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about the Center for Constitutional Studies. So we are a research center uh, situated here in the Faculty of Law at the University of Alberta, and we have two mandates, essentially. One is research. We publish journals, put on conferences, do research, and the other is public education. And so what we try to do with respect to our uh, public education mandate is to bring the Constitution to the people, which is one of the things we're trying to do uh, this evening, or this afternoon, I should say. And so, um, of course, many, as many of you know, the Supreme Court of Canada unanimously decided uh, on February 6, 2015, that Canadians had a constitutional right to receive uh, physician-assisted dying. And um, the court determined that, and I'm just going to read this, seriously and incurably ill Canadians who are suffering unbearably will have the choice to seek the assistance of a doctor to have comp a compassionate and peaceful death. Then the court gave um, Parliament a year uh, in which to enact new legislation to comply uh, with this new ruling. And uh, so the Liberal government, the fairly new Liberal government, went to the court in February to ask for an extension on that one year and received a four-month extension, which means that on June 6th uh, of this year, we need, or the, the Parliament government needs to have uh, new legislation in place. So what we're going to be hearing uh, from our panelists today is what the issues that need to be considered uh, around physician-assisted dying are and, and um, what some of those issues, um, how some of those issues need to be incorporated into our legislation or which ones should be included in, and perhaps which ones should not. Uh, we have three uh, speakers with us today and uh, so they are each of them going to speak for between 15 and 20 minutes and then we'll open the floor up to questions from you. And uh, there are mics on either side of the room for you if you wish to ask questions. Those of you who cannot get to a mic, just raise your hands and uh, one of us will, will uh, take a mic to you. And so, um, by way of introduction then of our, of our speakers, we'll begin with Dr. Will Johnston who practices family medicine and obstetrics in Vancouver. He is the chair of the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition of British Columbia and president of Canadian Physicians for Life. Uh, next, Reverend Brian Kiley, who is a minister serving in the United uh, Unitarian Church of Edmonton, will speak, and he is a spokesman for uh, Dying with Dignity Canada. And lastly, but not leastly, Professor Ubaka Agbogu, who is an assistant professor and cross-appointed 
to the faculties of law and pharmacy and pharmaceutical sciences will speak. Professor uh, Agbogu teaches torts, law and medicine, pharmacy, law and ethics, and health law uh, at the university here. And so, without further ado, um, we will begin with Dr. Johnston. <laughs> thank you, Pat, and uh, uh, thank you all for coming for such a, I think, an important discussion. Uh, am I clear to the back of the room? Can everyone hear? Okay. Um, I'm just going to move this back a tad here. And I'm, I'm going to start by, um, by saying that I'm a, I'm a family physician, and so I see uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of different things. I, I see people at many different times in their lives. Often I see people at very intense times of their lives. And so I have a very on-the-ground, from-the-trenches, uh, not highly theoretical view of, of the current problem, which, as I see it, is the public safety issue of, uh, of harm reduction in the context that uh, the Supreme Court says that come June the 6th, somebody has to qualify for a state-endorsed and a state-supplied via the state-controlled medical system death. So given that somebody has to qualify by the 6th of June, there's a uh, a frenzy of lawmaking or, or wannabe lawmaking going on in the background right now in Ottawa. For all I know, the, the fix is in and the law has been written for the past couple of months and, and the rest is just spin while, while they wait to unveil it. But I would like to think that the lawmakers are listening because I have a few red flags to raise, a few, a few little, little points of concern to raise that I hope will be helpful and I hope will diminish the body count as I see it from this, what I con consider to be disastrous and unnecessary uh, development at the Supreme Court level. I'll start with a story. <clears throat> Uncle Matt was a vigorous 80-year-old guy who was out hunting with his buddies near Hope, BC. And he'd finished his hunting trip. He actually has a wooden leg. And he was stumping along uh, on his wooden leg through the bush along with his hun hunting buggies, buddies. Vigorous guy, 80 years old. And when he got in the truck and he was headed back towards Hope, the left side of his body started to go a little bit weak. And he said, oh, take me home. I hate hospitals. Take me home. But by the time they were into getting closer to Chilliwack, uh, he was really limp on the left side of his body. He ended up in the hospital in Chilliwack with this stroke. And then they decided that his level of care was, was more than they wanted to offer at that point. They were worried about him, and they transferred him to the Royal Columbian Hospital. And then events began to unfold. He had a daughter with whom he'd often been at loggerheads. And all of my information is public uh, because this, was, uh, this later came out in the court proceeding that I'm going to describe. But in any case, when he got to Royal Columbian Hospital, her, the, his daughter declared that she was his, his substitute decision maker. She was his legal decision maker. And I was uh, lying in bed at quarter after seven on a Saturday morning in December of 2013 when my cell phone rang. And I thought, oh no. My cell phone number is on our website, and uh, someone talking about something about they're, they're trying to kill my uncle. And I thought, oh, not another one of these, because a lot of times I do get phone calls from people who truly misunderstand the intent of the medical staff in some maneuver for one of their loved ones who's in hospital. But as I listened, and, I, and it was easy to listen because I was too tired to talk, having just woken up, uh, I began to say, think, this Shelley doesn't sound crazy. This person, Shelley, does not sound crazy. I better listen up a little bit. And the story was that Shelley had been away on business, and when she had returned um, uh, six, five days before she phoned me, she discovered that Uncle Matt's feeding tube had come out five days before, and it wasn't going back down again. And when she went to Uncle Matt's daughter, her cousin, and said, why aren't you putting your dad's feeding tube back, back down? They've told me that you won't let them put the feeding tube back. Uh, her words, according to the, the court document, were, and according to her cousin Shelley, I've been making a tally. You know, I've tallied up the good things he's done in his life and the not-so-good things. I've tallied it up. And you know, lots of times my father wasn't a nice man. So Matt could say hungry and thirsty, and his hunting buddies asked him, do you want to live? And he said, yes. 
And he, he had, he, he, although he was having trouble speaking, he was able to choke out VGH. He wanted to be taken to VGH. And so another of Shelley's cousins is married to a guy named Mike, who, who, is, who, who she calls a cousin because he was kind of an adoptive son to Uncle Matt and very close to him. He was a Vietnamese refugee who Uncle Matt had taken under his wing and employed on one of his fishing boats. I should mention that Uncle Matt owned a lot of property. And, um, and so Shelley and Mike, on the Thursday, two days before Shelley had phoned me, went and kidnapped Uncle Matt. They threw him in a, in a wheelchair and they just rolled him out of Surrey Memorial and put him in one of these Vancouver taxis that are tall, funny looking little things that wheelchairs can go straight into. And they took her, him to VGH, where according to Shelley, once again, he was able to say to the triage nurse right there at, the, uh, at uh, 10th and Laurel in Vancouver, thirsty. But the nurse wasn't interested in that. She said, who are you guys? Are you the legal decision makers for this man? And they had to admit that, no, we're not, but you know, he, he, he needs fluids. She said, no, you, know, you have no authority. She phoned the ambulance. We didn't have to phone them. There's, the guys are milling around right there. They park ambulances right, right there. Take him back to Surrey. So back he went to Surrey Memorial. And then Shelley got on the internet and then she found my phone number. And here it was Saturday morning. And he had now been 10 days without food or fluids other than what uh, some of his visit visitors had been able to spoon into him until visiting was cut off completely by Matt's daughter on, uh, after, the, uh, after the Thursday escapade to VGH. And so uh, I listened well long and I thought, well, I don't really know if this is just um, a squabble inside the family and I'm not getting the straight goods and there's only one side and all the rest of it. But um, this sounds like there's, there's, it doesn't pass the sniff test. And so I arranged a lawyer and uh, long story short, um, emergency hearing in front of a judge, transcript available to anyone who asks me for it. And, um, and the judge uh, gave an order that Matt should be rehydrated pending the determination of his true wishes. Unfortunately, while the evidence was being given to the judge, Matt died. We only found that out because the order was served on the RCMP in Surrey and on Surrey Memorial Hospital and we got nothing back. It was like dropping a penny down a very deep well. And so um, we found out about 36 hours later that he, he was gone. And so. I have some observations about this chain of events. Number one, that hospital and hospitals in general have no system to ensure that authority will not be awarded to relatives or other caregivers who have an agenda. Number two, especially if a poor prognosis has been accepted by the hospital staff, it seems that the staff become sympathetic to the minimalist treatment plans set by the substitute authority figure and do not inquire as to whether there is another agenda. Three, hospitals cooperate with the decision maker to exclude dissenting voices by preventing their visits, often posting a security guard outside the hospital room when there is a conflict of opinions as to proper care. I have seen this several times. Four, Attending staff can be inaccessible at the best of times and will often refuse communication from dissenting voices even when there is no ethical barrier to the receipt of cautionary information from a concerned third party. Concerned third parties may find themselves stonewalled, not even knowing who is in charge of the care. Five. Hospital risk management officers, and I'm sure you, if you didn't know it, you must have always wondered whether there was someone responsible for this sort of thing in hospitals, and they're called risk management officers. But uh, they're there to minimize lawsuits against the hospital, not to act as ombudspersons in cases like Uncle Matt's. So to sum it all up, we can't even detect or prevent undue influence or outright abuse now. How is obliging the state to ensure a prompt death going to make it any easier? And into this atmosphere, the Parliamentary Committee would like to introduce state-endorsed killing, including killing by advanced directive, with no prior independent review. But let's just set aside this story of, of callousness and, and cruelty and irresponsibility in a, in a major hospital in British Columbia and travel to Belgium. Now in Belgium, uh, there, and this is not the only example of this, there, there was an older couple, 
identified only as, as uh, Francis, or I guess Francois, who was 89, and Anne, who was 86. And they um, had decided that, as they had been together for so many years, that they couldn't face the prospect that one of them would outlive the other. Now, their, their son Jean-Paul uh, uh, heard, heard this problem and uh, they said to him, you've got to find us a way that we can both die together. We want to commit suicide together. Uh, they weren't dying, and this, this is an important point. They both had the kind of chronic conditions that often come along with being 89 years old or 86 years old, but their son was able to doctor shop for them. He, he searched energetically because the first doctor said, this is wrong. Their own, own doctor said, this is wrong, but he found someone else for them. And um, as, as is described in the story that is available, by the way, in, in, the, in the Belgian, the Belgian um, sort of left, left of center uh, Flemish uh, publication, Humo, H-U-M-O, and uh, al also in Moustique, which is the, uh, the French, uh, there's a, a translation of it in Moustique. Uh, and if anyone wants these references, I'll be happy to, to um, uh, give them to Pat, perhaps, and, and have them uh, distributed. Um, the, the couple's three children were not willing to provide care to whichever of their parents became widowed. And the couple feared that the, uh, the, the, the nice nursing home care that they would prefer would eat into their savings. And you can, you can it, you, I'm not making this stuff up. Now, they were killed. I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard of a marketing technique called bait and switch. That's where you promise a really cheap car gets promised to you when you show up. Oh, that's been sold, but here's a more expensive one. Would you like to buy this one? Or, you know, we've got a, a 900 square foot, three bedroom apartment for rent. And when you show up, that's been rented, but we've got this, uh, this one bedroom apartment for twice the price over here. Would you like to buy that? So this marketing technique of bait and switch has been very much in evidence in this whole issue. How so, do you say? Because assisted suicide and euthanasia were, were sold to us originally as an extreme and necessarily rare solution to a terrible terminal illness involving untreatable pain. And as Wanda Morris, who used to be the uh, head of uh, Dying with Dignity, used to say as she, as she st stumped around the country supporting the Carter decision, you know, there was this farmer and he had cancer and uh, he had terrible pain. One day he took his shotgun, went around behind the barn. Now, how do you think his family felt cleaning that up? You know, and, and so it was just supposed to be for these extremely rare situations. And that, of course, begs the question, why, why wouldn't you just give good palliative care? But that's not what it was all about. It was sold as a solution to these extreme dying situations where the symptoms could not be controlled. Now, it turns out, that it doesn't have to do, have anything to do with dying at all. I mean, we're all going to die, but that turns out that this is not about dying. We will, we're well warned about the real agenda here. When uh, academic euthanasia activist Do Jocelyn Downey, who was going to be speaking here but had to, had to um, back out for other reasons, wrote in 2004 that any competent person's voluntary request for death should be granted. Any competent person. She has consistently repeated this proposal, saying in her 2011 polemic, which was disguised as a report from the Royal Society expert panel, that, quote, there are many individuals whose lives are no longer worth living to them. There is no principled basis for excluding them from assisted suicide or voluntary euthanasia. Professor Downey was a member of the legal team, which was successful in Carter. And uh, the brilliant lead counsel for the plaintiffs in Carter, Joe Arve, uh, told me once that he had for some time been interested in euthanasia for Alzheimer's patients. That is, for people who couldn't possibly be capable of giving consent at the time that they were killed. So another important bait and switch has to do with the number of deaths which would have to attend some kind of a regime that's being designed right now in Ottawa. Dr. Doug Cochran, an eminent pediatric neurosurgeon, member of the pro-euthanasia provincial and territorial expert advisory group that turned in their report to the joint special committee of parliament which has just given us their report. He said 
to me, this is really a tempest in a teapot. This will apply to maybe 20 people in BC. And this was the premise of the plaintiffs in Carter, that only a tiny number of people would be eligible to be killed under the authority and with the endorsement of the state. But Vancouver's own Dr. Ellen Weeb confidently predicts that about 1,225 such deaths a year in BC will be required. And in fact, she performed the first BC killing to be authorized under Carter in Vancouver a few days ago when she killed a woman with ALS who had, I, I, I suppose, flown out uh, from Calgary the previous day. So changing the law to hasten the deaths of a handful of dying people with unusually difficult symptoms is simply, su suddenly something much, much bigger. Far from being for people as the Supreme Court intended, like Gloria Taylor, who was living with ALS, our government's own committee is recommending a system more lax than the Belgian and the Dutch systems. As documented by psychiatrist Scott Kim and others, those places have endorsed the killing of, now bear with me, people with spina bifida, autism, Asperger syndrome, dementia, depression, bereavement, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, psychosis, PTSD, generalized anxiety, phobias, OCD, panic, social phobia, bipolar depression, somatoform disorders uh, such as pain disorders, somati somatization disorder and hypochondria, substance abuse, anorexia, nervosa, bulimia, mental retardation, incipient dementia, brain tumor, surgical sequelae, stroke, alexithymia, look that one up, Cotard syndrome, look that one up, Dissociative disorder, factitious disorder, reactive attachment disorder, and kleptomania. And those are only the psychiatric diagnoses that, that have been used to kill. Psychiatrist Paul Applebaum is similarly alarmed and notes that 52% of the Dutch cases and 50% of the Belgian psychiatric euthanasia cases carry diagnoses of personality disorders, which invalidate the assessment of capability and consent, or at least hugely complicate that assessment. 20% of euthanized psychiatric patients had never had a psychiatric hospitalization. They'd never been hospitalized, and yet they were euthanized. The ratio of women to men was 2.3 to 1, 70% women. 56% of cases, social isolation or loneliness was an important factor. 24% of cases, the three independent physician reviewers disagreed among themselves about whether the case justified euthanasia, but they were killed. 56% of the patients had refused recommended treatment. 12% of the cases the psychiatrist involved believed that the criteria were not met, but assisted death took place anyway. In 27% of cases, patients requested assistance in dying from a physician who was not familiar with their own case, had never met them before. And in another, 38%, another study, 38% of those Belgian psychiatric patients who asked for physician assistance to die withdrew the request to die before the evaluation could be completed, raising questions about the wisdom of, the, of our own Joint Special Committee recommending the elimination or minimization of waiting periods. So the Joint Special Committee has brought, bought entirely into a very flimsy safeguard concept that the opinion of capability and consent from two doctors with no prior review by any third party should suffice to authorize a euthanasia or an assisted suicide. When questioned in an information session, questioned by me that is, the BC College of Physicians and Surgeons Registrar, Dr. Otter, was apparently baffled by the question, is there a limit to how many doctors a patient or their representative could shop to get an authorization for assisted suicide? She was baffled by that. Clearly, there is no such limit foreseen. It seems obvious that doctors like Ellen Weeb want to become widely known as the go-to people for these practices. Last year in Oregon, one single physician wrote 12% of all their lethal prescriptions, while 105 others wrote the rest. Research by Linda Ganzini, who's no, who's no supporter of, of a ban on assisted suicide, she testified for the plaintiffs in the Carter, the Carter decision. Su suggests that from her own research that patients will be more likely to be deemed capable to consent to assisted suicide by doctors who approve of assisted suicide. This should not be surprising and it all adds up to one thing. The proposed guidelines won't stop wrongful deaths. If we are willing to ban capital punishment on the possibility that there might be one wrongful death, what are we doing contemplating a system which is guaranteed to provide us 
with wrongful deaths. And it's, it is no rebuttal to that to say, but murderers don't want to die. I'm not talking about the murderers. I'm talking about the people in the healthcare system who could be led into a wrongful death because of the mere existence of the offer of assisted suicide hanging in the air in a healthcare institution. And lest you, uh, lest you think that this is not plausible, how am I doing for time? Three minutes? Okay. Um, I think I can make it. Here's, here's an email I received from a, a cardiologist who heard about what the Joint Special Committee had just suggested, which was a, a, which a, a wide open lax system lacking any kind of a prior judicial review of whether uh, the elements of consent were present. He said, I remember a patient, and I'll, I'll just simply read through his email. The issue with the patient was as follows, without going into certain details, he had no family doctor with hospital privileges and presented to emerge with a treatable complication of an uncurable cancer and I was consulted. The immediate threat to his life, which would have limited it to a few weeks, was the complication which I arranged to be successfully treated by the head of department at VGH, which was done by transfer to and from our hospital. He's in a community hospital. The patient had been admitted and then was seen to VGH, was seen by a succession of hospitalists and doctors on call, some of whom did not actually see the patient. Then he was sent back to my hospital, writes my contact. Because of the primary diagnosis of an untreatable, eventually untreatable cancer, he was referred to a palliative care physician who made unwarranted assumptions about his prognosis, assuming that as he had been consulted, the patient must have had a proper assessment by somebody, but made no effort to confirm that in fact the patient was terminal, did not contact me or read my consult, was, an, was unaware of the procedure that had happened at VGH and concluded that the patient was then imminently terminal and concurred with the administration of doses of analgesics which were not indicated. Complicating this was a phone call from a nurse at night to an on-call doctor for morphine, which was given in large doses. Neither the nurse or the doctor knew the patient, and the doctor relied on the nurse's assessment and did not even see the patient. I was not aware of the doses of morphine. Nobody contacted me as to the prognosis, which was, in fact, many months, had this unfortunate sequence of events not occurred. As I was a consultant, I didn't see the patient daily. There was a series of events. This was very disturbing to me, and although a formal inquiry was held at my request, there were no consequences. That's just one story. This is what I'm worried about. So I, I'm going to end by, by asking the question, what should Parliament do? Well, we, we have some relevant sections of the Criminal Code, 241A and B and 14. So number A, state clearly, Parliament should, in the new law, state clearly that counselling another to commit suicide, that is the current content of Section 241A, remains an offence. B, state clearly that assisting suicide, that is the current content of sec Section 241B, remains an offence and that the intent of the law is to prevent suicide in general. The drafters of the new law should, if they create a defense for assisting suicide in certain circumstances, make it clear that such a defense against prosecution is an exception and not a right given to the assisting physician. C. State clearly that it is not lawful for a person to agree to have someone else kill them. That's the content currently of section 14. The drafters of the new law should, if they create a defense for agreeing to be killed in certain circumstances, make it clear that such a defense against prosecution is an exception and not a right. D. Lethal med medications intended for euthanasia and assisted suicide should be dispensed only to physicians who will be providing or supervising the procedures and those physicians should take charge of unused poisons afterward and should remain until the death ensues. E. The law should require expedited review by a court of any proposed assisted suicide or medical homicide, which is technically what we're talking about here. In view of the extreme gravity of the actions concerned, the abuses which have occurred under permissive euthanasia, euthanasia regimes, such as Belgium and the Netherlands, and I, I can provide the references, and the mismatch between the purpose and, purposes and competencies of physicians and the purposes and high requirements of the Carter judgment. F, require consultation with family members and those close to a patient. 
the autonomy pendulum having swung as far as it has gone, um, we are now told that patient confidentiality is, is uh, supreme, but I would suggest that patient confidentiality and rights to privacy are never absolute and must have limits which ensure at least that people are not killed without the knowledge of their loved ones and to make possible genuine assessment of capacity and voluntariness. G, prohibit the falsification of death certificates. We can get into that later. That's what Quebec is, is mandating right now, is that, that people lie on the death certificate. H, declare it a criminal offense to direct anyone to participate in any way against their will in assisted suicide or euthanasia. And I, declare it a criminal offense to disadvantage or discriminate in any way against any healthcare profession applicant, student, practitioner, or healthcare institution on the basis of their decision to avoid participation in assisted suicide or euthanasia. I believe that legislation respecting these principles could reduce wrongful deaths under the new law and preserve a safe space in the Canadian healthcare system for those who do not want their loved ones or themselves to have anything to do with assisted suicide or euthanasia. Thank you. Hello, I'm Brian. Thank you all for being here, and those of you who are students of this fine institution, I'd like to inform you that there will be an exam following. <laughs> My name is Brian Kiley. I am here as a spokesperson for Dying with Dignity in Canada. I've been a supporter and advocate of choice in dying for nearly 30 years here, and before that in British Columbia. I'm also a minister of the Unitarian Church of Edmonton, it's a liberal religion. Our denomination has been a very strong supporter of choice and dying issues for about 30 years, and I'm honored to have played a part in drafting the curricula that helped us formulate and drafting the policy that our denomination has been pursuing, suggesting that people should have choice in dying, including excellent palliative care, including all kinds of options and full information. I was most uh, intrigued uh, by Dr. Johnston's uh, presentation about how nowhere in his speech did the individual patient come into play, their consent, their opinion, their view. It was all about what the medical profession should do unto them. Uh, and that is a position that I disagree with. All my life, I firmly believed in the worth and dignity of the individual and their right to choose. And in the same way, the government has no right to tell me how to live my life, so long as I'm not harming or infringing on the rights of others, the government should not have control over my dying. Well, the Supreme Court of Canada, in my view, established this in their landmark, and in my view, inevitable decision of a year ago. And I'm sure our good law professor who will follow me will correct me if I'm wrong. In a few weeks, it will be the law of the land, one way or another. And this is a nation where allowing people to live their lives as they choose is the default position of our bill, our, our code of human rights and practices. We've seen this in the access to abortion de debates decades ago, the decision to allow same-sex marriage, the use of traditional and ceremonial religious dress in the public forum, Ours is a nation of live and let live, and now, in some cases, for those who wish to do so and can clearly state that they wish to do so, we will become one of those lands where people will be allowed to live and let die on their own terms. Now, as much as some people would like to turn back the clock, that's not going to happen. This new freedom is what Canadians want. Dr. James Silvius, Medical Director of Community, Seniors, Addiction, and Mental Health for Alberta Health. Man, that's a busy job description. He noted this change of mind in the country. Dr. Silvius is in charge of the team figuring out how AHS is going to respond to the changing law because the laws are not out there yet, but in June, uh, the, the hospital system, the medical system, is going to have to deal with it one way or the other. In Tuesday's journal, he was quoted as saying that he was surprised 
by the quiet consensus of Canadians responding to the court ruling. He said, there have not been very many noisy objections. It's been rather a muted response, he said, for something as society changing as this. Well, I don't find his response surprising at all, or the public response surprising at all. There have been a few high-profile cases every few years, and each one has brought more and more people to the side of choice in dying. Public opinion has been on the positive side for over 25 years, and the number of people supporting physician-assisted dying has grown every year. And in for the last several years, the affirmative responses in public surveys is well over 80%. This is no 50% plus one margin call. This is the will of the public. The country is ready for this change to happen. Well, our organizers of this conference, and thank you for having us, sent us a few questions to consider, and I'm going to actually take them one by one because they were really good questions. So what should the role of physicians be? Well, the prior question that has to be asked is, who's in charge of the critical decision? The physician or the patient? The person who is standing up or the person who is lying down and suffering? At nearly all levels of medical ethics and codes of practice, it is the mentally competent patient who is supposed to be in command of their case. It is the medical professional's obligation to provide all the information necessary regarding the case and possible treatments and potential outcomes and prognoses. It is the medical professional's obligation to provide all reasonable care or to hand the case off to another qualified physician if they feel that they cannot meet those obligations. And it is interesting that a physician, according to the Alberta Medical Association, who, a physician who does not meet these obligations and refer patients to competent care can be charged professionally and ethically with abandoning their patient. So, first, it looks like the legislation, following successful models in other jurisdictions, will require that physicians assisting in death will provide necessary medications and be urged to be on hand in case there are complications. And Dr. Johnson is correct. The law is not out there. There are many suggestions on the floor, uh, but we all know that parliamentary committees, their recommendations are not often the defining factor of parliamentary laws. So this means that the physician's decision is to provide primarily the lethal cocktail, but not to decide whether or not someone gets to use it. They are to participate in physician-assisted death but not if it's against their personal moral code. Then they have to refer. However, such decisions, such physicians who do demur should be required to refer. Otherwise, they're abandoning their patients. A few weeks ago, Covenant Health held a, a very prominent press conference uh, with the Archbishop and a number of other people, including a physician who said categorically he would not refer patients because that would make him complicit in their death. And I had the opportunity to uh, discuss and debate with him on CBC Radio uh, a couple of days later. We debated the point on the morning show, and I pointed out then, and I still believe, that his argument about complicity does not wash, that his first duty is to his patient and to refer that patient to the care they need. Because he doesn't like it and because he's not comfortable with it, I absolutely agree he should not participate in assisting that person in dying. But neither can he or she stand back and simply walk away from the patient. Another story a few days later told of the Calgary woman that Dr. Johnston referenced who had to go to British Columbia after she received permission from the court. She said she could not find a doctor in Alberta. I don't dispute that. But again, on Dr. On Tuesday, Dr. Silvius of Alberta Health noted that he now has a list of 80 physicians in all regions of the province who are willing to volunteer to assist. The unfortunate case of the Calgary woman having to travel to another jurisdiction should not be repeated. But the question of where she might have died in Alberta is still open. 
whether it was hospital or hospice or home. I have to deviate from the moral questions for just a moment because Dr. Silvius also noted that Alberta Catholic Covenant Care will refuse to allow physician-assisted services because they are a Catholic organization. Well, Covenant runs 23 hospitals and nursing homes in the province, and they manage 90%, 90% of the palliative care beds. Now, I'm very respectful of the religious viewpoints. Uh, Archbishop Smith is a colleague. Uh, I enjoy working with him on other social justice projects. <coughs> Excuse me. On the other hand, I am deeply troubled that these institutions are funded by public money. People are admitted to these hospitals not because of their religious affiliation, but because of where they happen to live. In the case of hospitals and bed availability, in the case of palliative care units. And most of the patients, in fact, they're about 25% of the population is nominally Roman Catholic, which means arguably 75% of the patients and 75% of the staff of the Covenant Health Hospitals are not covered by the moral precepts of the Catholic Church. Why should the morality of one religion get to overrule the laws of the province and the country, especially for people who are not part of that religious faith? This is deeply concerning, and this is something that's going to have to be resolved. My guess is in the courts. It means because of bad luck, a significant percentage of the possibility will be denied this legal service unless they check themselves out of hospital and find another practitioner. I find it outrageous that our tax dollars are being used to support an institution that is threatening to break the law of the land. The second question was who should have access? Oh, this was very interesting. I'm, um, Uncle Matt should not have died. Okay? Uncle Matt should not have died. By the way, Uncle Matt is not covered in any way, shape, or form by the legislation that's being contemplated. And I'll get into that in a moment. Um, advanced care directives are not yet in anybody's recommendations, even our recommendations about what should, what should be allowed under choice and dying. Advanced care directives without backup is not sufficient to allow this to happen. We have very good evidence from several jurisdictions in the United States and Europe about how this can work safely. And oh, just one other thing. I was interested that Dr. Johnston liked to lift up individual stories. Under any legal principle, any law, any rule governing anything, you can find horror stories, individual horror stories, because the law does not work perfectly ever. And I can also tell you from personal experience that people are dying with assistance from physicians, from nurse practitioners, and from family members, dying and dying beautifully, even if it's illegal. It's happening. What we can do is regulate it, bring some sanity to it, bring some reasonable safeguards to it, and allow it to be a dignified and legal situation. Well, we have not seen the proposed legislation other than Quebec, but it is likely, certainly from all the advocates I've seen, that the first is there's going to be need for agreement from two physicians that the patient has grievous and irremediable medical situation, in the words of the court, Second, that there will need to be at least two requests from the patient with some as yet unspecified time period, cooling off period in between. These requests will each need two witnesses, at least one of whom is not a relative and heir and one who is not a director of the medical facility. And third, the patient will need to remain competent and awake until the very moment that the lethal dose is administered. Now this strikes me as a pretty reasonable set of safeguards. 
if those are what come into play. And we don't know, as he pointed out. But those are safeguards that I certainly can support. Are they perfect? No. Are they 100% guaranteed? No. Will people be able to defraud the system? Yes, because that always happens. It happens anywhere. It happens in all kinds of things. Uh, it happens in people who say, yes, I'm fine to drive, and then go out and kill three people in a car accident. We call those people criminals, and we put them in jail for it. To what extent should government control the process? Should there be a uniform policy for all Canadians, and what role should the provinces play? Well, I'm sure my legal friend will answer that one, but I'm going to uh, say a couple of things. I'm not sure that the government controls the process, but as in all medical issues, it has a role in regulating care. The federal government legislation will no doubt set some broad guidelines, but as in all things medical, the provinces have the responsibility to shape and deliver the exact courses of care. So I have a final thought. Over the years, I have encountered many, many versions of the slippery slope argument. It's all imperfect. It can all be damaged. People can break the law. People can get around it. I have encountered the stories that Dr. Johnston told. Opponents argue that the elderly will be disposed of six or seven weeks early so that greedy families can speed up granny's death and get hold of the property, which will, as you people probably know much better than I just how long it will be tied up in probate before they actually get hold of it. That the mentally challenged or the physically disabled will be killed off as in Hitler's Germany. There have been any number of scare tactics. But several peer-reviewed studies, and I have one and will provide the references if you like, several peer-reviewed studies have taken a look at this and shown there is no demonstrable risk of higher rates of assisted death for people in vulnerable groups. The only one group that had a slightly higher uptick in number was AIDS patients in the 1990s. Is it possible to find a single case if you look hard enough? Absolutely, no problem. But under legal guidelines from the court, I suspect we will have a word to describe such cases where the protocols are not fire, followed. The word is murder. And it's wrong to think that this change in the law will start a huge stampede. I mentioned that the woman from Calgary, um, uh, the woman from Calgary who had to go over in death. Right now, there are four other requests before Alberta courts. Worldwide, where physician-assisted death is legal, between 0.1 and 0.15 percent of deaths are assisted by physicians. It is not a huge number. Will it be 20? No. In the province of Alberta, uh, it would roughly be a couple of hundred, about 250 to 300, if we followed the statistical norms in a given year. But I also believe that if we have very good palliative care, if we provide the medical and health supports that are necessary, very few people will opt to end their lives. It is not an easy thing to do. I have been the minister at many suicides, the minister at many memorial services for suicides and for people who have died difficult deaths. It is our nature to cling to life. We don't like the idea of dying. Even the people who have committed suicide did it with a great sense of deliberation because their emotional pain was so intense. We live in Canada, my final thought. We live in Canada where the rights of the individual are respected and enshrined in many of our laws. We have a philosophical commitment to alleviating suffering and enhancing quality of life whenever possible for as long as people wish to live that life. Allowing the terminally ill or suffering person the opportunity to decide the manner of their dying is not immoral and pretty soon it will no longer be illegal. I submit that this is one of the most moral and humane things that we can do. Thank you. Good evening. So I'd like to thank my 
our co-panelists for uh, kicking off this very interesting discussion. Um, I'm going to try and be the, the poor man's uh, Jocelyn Downey, since she cannot be here today. So I'll step into that role because I'm a lawyer. And the good thing about being a lawyer is that once the law is clear, you can actually just ignore the moral and ethical debate and stick to the law. <laughs> so um, I, I think all of the morality, uh, moral questions around this, the ethical questions around this have been sufficiently covered and they've been discussed uh, for a long time, over a long time in Canada. Uh, we first confronted this debate in the 90s when the Rodriguez case brought it to prominence and we've been talking about it since then. Uh, fortunately for everyone, we now have some clear guidance, something to actually debate. That's not uh, our views on either side of the question, so I'm going to stick to that. The first thing to note is that I do agree with um, Brian that it is now inevitable that we're going to have legal rules that regulate this question. Now we can have all kinds of concerns and worries about the moralities and the ethics around it, but we have clear guidance at least from the Supreme Court of Canada with respect to what the minimum standards should be. Those minimum standards are important. They're important because that's where I think we should begin the debate from. The only question we can talk about right now is whether we expand that or we stay there. There can't be a contraction. You can't design a policy going forward that takes away from what the Supreme Court has said is the way to proceed in order to be able to comply with the Constitution. Now, why is that important? It's important because we're a country of laws. We're a country that has set up a system where we can resolve our disagreements by following certain processes. And once we've, arri once we've gone through those processes and we've arrived at an answer, we all agree that even if we don't like the answer, we're going to respect it. And the Supreme Court has given us an answer, and that answer should be our starting point. So for my purposes, I think the standards and the criteria set by the Supreme Court is a flaw. We can't have any policy that goes uh, behind, that tries to uh, um, destroy that flaw. That is the minimum standard. And what did the Supreme Court say? If you're an adult person who's competent, who is facing a grievous and irremediable medical condition, which cannot be alleviated by any treatment, which is acceptable to you, and which causes you enduring pain and suffering, then you can get physician-assisted death. This is a quite a narrow category. My personal feelings on the matter, I can share with you outside of this. I do have an opinion on this, um, but I think it's quite narrow. And that is the point that we have to start from. Anything else that, that's a contraction of that will be unconstitutional. It will go back to court, we'll start to fight again about it, we'll go back to the same debates, and we'll end up there. So that's where we need to start from. The only question right now is, should this be expanded? And I think the two, my two co-panelists have talked about what an expansion will do. So let's talk th about that for a bit. The experience in other countries does show that there are risks and harms associated with physician-assisted death. But this, the, those risks and harms are not the law in those countries. There are things that happen because anytime you have a healthcare service, it, implementation might lead to some things that you don't want to see. But for the most part, the stories you hear don't represent what is going on in those systems for the most part. The truth of the matter is, if the law is implemented today in Canada, there might be abuses. But this happens for every other aspect of healthcare. For most healthcare services, that is not a reason to say 
the system is broken or that it cannot be fixed. I think even if we have abuses, and even if we do have them, with good regulation, with sensible regulation, we can avoid some of those pitfalls. So as a starting point, I think the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court decision needs to be respected. Whatever we end up with has to be that or an expansion. Now, what do I think is actually going to happen? As a law professor, I don't think the federal government should do anything other than to say, the sections of the criminal code which make it illegal and a criminal act to um, carry out physician-assisted death, those sections are now repealed. And after doing that, you should say, thank you very much. Good night, everyone. That's all we have to do about this matter. Why? Because we live in a country where we've set up a, a constitution that tells us how the different levels of government should act and on what matters they should act on. In Canada, we're a federal state. The agreement we have in the constitution is that when it comes to matters of health, the provinces should play a larger role. The Supreme Court decision has made this matter a healthcare matter. Physician-assisted death in Canada today, by virtue of the Supreme Court decision, is a healthcare service. It is the same as any other healthcare service. And provinces decide what happens with respect to healthcare services. I don't think we should go crying at the altar of national, int national interests any time we have a controversial issue. It is not for the federal government to decide what should happen here. All they should say is, we agree with the Supreme Court that those sections of the criminal code no longer apply, and we're going to step out of it. Now, when they step out of it, they can come back in by bringing everyone together in an informal way to talk about how they might develop uniform standards so we don't have a patchwork of regulations across the country. But for the most part, the provinces should be allowed to deal with this as they see fit within their own uh, territory. So I, I, I would like to see this develop, and I think this is the way it's going to go. I think the federal government is going to react very minimally and then leave it to the provinces to determine how this healthcare service is going to be provided. Now, if it comes back to the provinces, there's a risk that we're going to have a patchwork of regulations across the country. I don't think that's a bad thing. That is exactly the kind of country we live in. That's exactly the kind of country that we've set up and that we have. But each province must react by establishing the criteria set by the Supreme Court at a minimum. Now, I think each province should also start small. All these debates about what will happen to people with mental illness, what will happen to you know, all kinds of stories all kinds of scenarios. That's not what we're talking about here. We have a very narrow scope, and I think the provinces should start by adopting that. Why? Because you want to gain some experience before you actually start to do other things. It is controversial enough as it is now. The better thing to do is to implement what the Supreme Court has said, because we've had time to think about it. We all here have had time to think about it. We've all come to accept it. It is now familiar to us. We've even seen someone here in Alberta use that criteria to achieve assisted death. I think every province should start from there. Now, as we go forward, each province can then decide how they want to expand their own uh, regime or policies. Because there are other things to think about that are beside all of these slippery slope concerns which are much more important and which may actually cause more problems for the system than talking about whether or not we're going to allow you know, children, uh, the people who are mentally ill, all of that stuff, to me, at this point, is noise. Now, here are some of the issues we need to think about if every province agrees to adopt these minimum standards or these narrow standards set by the Supreme Court. The first thing is access. It's a healthcare service. We don't want to have a rethread of the abortion scenario. It's a healthcare service. If it's a healthcare service, we should think about how to provide reasonable access 
to those who want the healthcare service. Regardless of how you feel about the matter, it's legal. It's something that healthcare providers provide, so it's a healthcare service. But access is going to be an issue. We saw the case of the Calgary woman who had to go to British Columbia to gain access. We've heard stories about institutions saying they won't allow their employees to engage in the service and they won't provide resources for it. We've heard about doctors saying they wouldn't do it. We've heard pharmacists saying they wouldn't uh, fill the prescriptions. I think all of that is fine. But what that suggests to me is that the province needs to get everyone to some table to talk about how to provide reasonable access. If you don't provide reasonable access, then people will want to circumvent the rules. People will want to push this into a black market, and that's when you start to see some of these abuses come into play. So I think the province needs to think carefully about how to get everyone into the same room to, think about, to talk about access. Now, in terms of access, I do agree with Brian that physicians can express a conscientious objection, but should also facilitate alternative access. The reason for that is that this is not the first time that physicians have had to confront issues of conscience. I mean, what are we talking about here? The practice of medicine is over you know, several centuries old. People have expressed objections to all kinds of things over time, and we've developed rules to deal with that. No physician in the room today, there's no physician in the room who does not know how conscientious objection works. This is a healthcare service. Why should we create different rules for it? It isn't, it is, it's not any different from having an objection to the morning after pill or to abortion. They have rules for dealing with this. And the rules state that if you have an objection, as someone who provides an essential public service, as someone who took an oath to not just think about yourself, but to think about other people, the bare minimum you can do, because this is really about the human condition, the bare minimum you can do for your fellow human being who needs the healthcare service is to provide a referral or to provide some means that will allow them to gain access without hardship. That preserves your beliefs while also doing the thing that you're expected to do as a healthcare professional. The other issue, of course, is going to be institutional objection. Can institutions have an objection? Well, there's all kinds of issues with that. Say I want to help patients with, with assisted death, but I work in an institution that has said no. What does that mean for me? Do I lose my job on this narrow issue? How will that feel for me? So I think, again, institutions need to think, look, we can express an objection. We can have a policy that says we, are not, we don't like this, but they also have an obligation to provide reasonable alternatives that don't cause hardship to their patients. As Brian noted, some of these institutions play a very substantial role in palliative care. Now that's, that's important. If they do that, they have to understand that choice matters for the people who are the residents of their, of their homes. And they have to try as much as possible within the confines of their beliefs to facilitate alternative access. Now, who should have access? Again, the two, my two co-panelists have covered this, but I, as I said before, I think our starting point should be what the Supreme Court said. Presently, I don't think we're going to get anything in any province or even at the federal level that expands that to any uh, degree. It's going to be what the Supreme Court said. We're not going to find that they're saying, let's now add minus to it. There's not going to be any broadening of the categories. What we're going to get come June 6th will be competent adults who clearly consent, who meet that medical criteria that the Supreme Court has set. You have to have a very brave government who will want to, you know, now that you've mastered how to actually manage public opinion and controversy around one issue, you, you want to, I don't think it will be wise to, to destroy that by introducing something new 
that creates an entirely new level of controversy. And that would be irresponsible in my view because we need to gain some experience, a Canadian experience, about how these narrow provisions will work before we do something else. You can talk about Belgium, you can talk about the Netherlands, you can talk about you know, the US and all these countries. That's not Canada. There are things that happen in the US, all that Donald Trump stuff, that will never happen here. <laughs> right? Uh, we're a very unique country in a lot of ways. We understand live and let live. We also understand, to a great, great extent, the need for caution. Canadians don't, you know, want to annoy anyone. We don't want to take giant strides without actually understanding where we're going. That's our nature. It's our philosophy. It's our culture. We take small bites. And I think we should take a small bite of this, see what happens, and then examine our comfort level as we go along. Now, the reason I think that that's what's going to happen is because, is because Quebec actually did something about this before the Supreme Court decision. And what they did is also very narrow. Right? And Quebec is the most European province in Canada. And they're not even willing to be Belgium. Is Alberta going to be Belgium? I don't think so. So I, I think we need to have you know, some perspective on this issue. We're going to start small. And small is how it's going to be until we master it. And then we decide how we're going to expand it. And I say that as someone who wants to see an expansion. Let me be very clear. That's why I sit as an expansion but I think we should start small. Now, the other issue, of course, we're going to have, even if we deal with the access issues, and we deal with you know, trying to convince people who uh, object to it to come on board, is how we deal with end of life in general. I think we're kind of losing uh, sight of the fact that this is a, an end of life issue. There's all kinds of things that affect the end of one's life. And this would be less of an issue if we actually cared as a country about end-of-life issues. By, sh by um, quick you know, show of hands, how many people here have made a living will or an advanced directive? Well, that's actually pretty good. Right. Everyone should start thinking about that. Right? But no one thinks about it. The, the, the polls show that Canadians care about it but do nothing about it and don't think about it much. Palliative care is an issue in this country. People say it's, a, it's another option, but there's so few palliative care beds. Um, people are not able to gain access to palliative care even when they want it. And if we don't fix end-of-life care and end-of-life decision-making and end-of-life issues, we're going to end up with a situation where this becomes the only option for people, not, because, not necessarily because that's the option they would have loved to choose if all the other options were available, but because they've been forced to because it is the only one that's available to them. Maybe this is a, an opportunity now that we're all focused on it. Now that we've, you know, if I had a, if we're going to have a talk about palliative care, I doubt we'll have a full room. It'll probably be just me and one person over here talking about palliative care. But now that we have, we're, we're, on, this, we're on this subject now, it is time to hit your MLA hit your MP, and talk about end of life. Because this is an end of life issue. And we are all going toward the end of life in some fashion. We will get there. And when you get there, you want to have more than one option, more than one good option. And if you choose this one, if you choose the one we're talking about today, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But it should be a free and autonomous choice and one that gets you to where you want to go. So to summarize, I think the federal government should do very little because that's what our constitution requires them to do. Little. Get out of the room. Let the provinces handle it. I think the provinces should take small bites. Start small and see where we go. Gain some experience. See where we go. I think healthcare providers should go back to their rules and read it. They know what to do about conscientious objections. This is not new. I think healthcare providers should also realize that this is a healthcare service. If I became a doctor, I would absolutely hate to do surgery on anyone because I'll faint each time. Because I hate blood. So that's why I didn't become a doctor. When you choose to become a doctor, 
you choose to accept things that are not pleasant and to deal with them and to show compassion and to reach above uh, to heights that other humans like me can't reach. That is why you know, they have to work weird hours. That's why, you know, when they have to go into work on Saturday when I'm at home, they do more than we do. And they have to accept that this is one of those things that comes with medical practice and be able to adjust their perspective to fit that. Because this is not the first issue they've confronted like this. It's been an issue, and they know how to deal with this. And lastly, we need to deal with end-of-life care because it's a big issue in Canada. It's not a real choice if someone doesn't have any other, other, other options. And until you actually provide good options, a range of options, we can say that we actually didn't assist at death. Right. Those are my comments. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to our panelists for some very thought-provoking um, ideas. And so now we're going to open the floor f to questions. And uh, I know some of you have already expressed reservations about what may happen in this section of the, of the evening. So I'm just going to uh, begin with a little caveat, which is to say we've heard from the people that we've asked to speak. And so if you could respect the fact that we've asked you to provide questions not to make speeches, that would be great. Uh, from a democratic standpoint, I think it gives more people in the room the opportunity to ask questions. So if you could please keep your questions as brief as you possibly can. I know some of you have to provide some context, but please do that in a reasonable fashion so that we can get as many questions as possible uh, to our panelists. Um, and just before I forget, I, I, I've neglected to uh, thank our, our student group who has very, very kindly provided the uh, pizza, <laughs> which some of you may have partaken of before uh, we began the session this evening. So uh, David is here from that, David Foster. Thank you very much. So uh, we'll open the floor up to questions, and uh, I'll try to do the best I can to, to ensure that we uh, hear from as many of you as possible. And as I indicated before, if you cannot make it to a microphone, please just lift up your hand, and one of us will take the microphone to you. So we'll start with um, the microphone on the right. Thank you. Am I on? Yes, you are. I have two very brief questions, one for Brian. You said that the abuses were the occasional exception in places like Holland and Belgium. If you review the government's own report, beginning with the Remelink report in the late 90s and the latest 2014 report, every year there are about 1,000 cases of involuntary euthanasia. Now, the most liberal adjustments made by any commentator is half of them may possibly have expressed a desire at some time. That's 500 a year. Let's be even more liberal and cut it to 250 a year over the some 25 years. Those are exceptions. The other question I have is for the law professor. I'm sorry, I can't remember your name. I'd have to see it in print in order to memorize it. <laughs> You mentioned, I'm a physician, by the way. In fact, my 50th anniversary is coming up in a few months. That we have taken an oath to serve our patients. That's true. We are, that same oath also bound me never to take a patient's life. Uh, how can you appeal to one part of an oath and not the other? Uh, well, thank you for that question. I, I would like to refer to our law professor's statement as well, that uh, this is Canada. Uh, this is not the Netherlands. Um, <clears throat> I actually have a very good friend who has sat in on uh, as a minister, as the spiritual advisor on uh, several uh, assisted deaths. And yeah, there are breaches of law and there are involuntary deaths and they are murders. 
and the purpose of that report was to suggest that they need better oversight and that they need better and more thorough uh, review of their own safeguards and regulations. Um, and I think that's the lesson that we take from those, uh, those cases. Um, but the idea that people are using a somewhat legal structure in order to do that, I think it's, um, I think it's unreasonable to assume that those deaths would not have occurred, that someone would have helped them over the edge because uh, it, is, it is people who are, uh, have their own interest who, who are stepping in and putting themselves in front of the, the patient's care. But more to the point, and I think the most important point, is that we're being very clear in the proposed regulations that I've seen that there has to be consent at the time of the administration of medicine. And I think that that's going to be the, the most significant likelihood of preventing those things. Will there be accidents? Will there be mistakes? Will there be unfortunate cases? Yes, but there are now in all manner of things. Um, so I'll leave it there to let room for more questions. Thank you for the question. So um, you referred to the Hippocratic Oath uh, that doctors take you know, and the, um, the original formulation of the Hippocratic Oath about not taking lives. But it's, it's a document, even in, in its ancient form, that has a number of uh, commandments, uh, which also includes respecting the wishes of patients. And it has to be read uh, as, a, as a whole document, not by, by just looking at one provision. And since the time the Hippocratic Oath um, was was written or found, there have been successive improvements on it over time. Uh, today in Canada, the, the Canadian Medical Association and colleges around the country uh, have rules that explain to physicians about what to do to balance some of these conflicts that arise uh, with respect to you know, taking life, respecting wishes, uh, and there are rules around all of that. Now let me try and summarize the rules. We, we are in a, in a a model of uh, physician involvement in healthcare that emphasizes uh, respecting patient choice. I will say it's the dominant idea today. We, we've shifted from uh, the point where physicians have to determine in all kinds of ways what happens to the patient, regardless of the patient's wishes. That's the dominant model. And in that model, there's an understanding that you're acting as a physician in your patient's best interests. Now, I, I think it's fair to say that a physician who has an objection to that idea can say, I don't want to participate. But I think many physicians in the room and around the country do understand that they have to navigate these ethical quandaries. And at the end of the day, want to, what they want to do is to do something that is in the best interests of their patients. And I don't think that what I'm suggesting is inconsistent with that. I think it's quite consistent with it. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, there have been cases where physicians have actually applied to court to withdraw uh, life support from a patient because they don't think it's in the patient's best interests to continue to be on life support. We're not going to sit, sit here and say, oh, that is inconsistent with the Hippocratic Oath. It is not because it's a reasonable balance based on a determination of the patient's best interests. Physicians take lives in other contexts and in other ways that are perfectly okay. This is just one more example. It's nothing new. Um, if, if I might comment, I think there is some confusion here. Um, I don't think anyone disagrees that we are all trying to do what's in our patient's best interest. Um, the real question is, uh, going at it from the patient-centered point of view, do patients really want a healthcare system in which some people are coerced to do what they believe to be wrong? Because that's really what we're talking about. You see, uh, the reason why there has been a, rel a relatively calm reception of the Supreme Court's uh, ruling is that most people um, assume that um, it's, it's about control and it's about their own personal choice, which I want. Who in this room doesn't want control and want their own personal choice? But most people assume that the way the system is going to work is that when they get to the point where it's going to become really personal for them, that they will have that control. They're making this assumption that the, the amount of choice and control that they wish to have is actually going to be available to them, that the choice is being made um, that suddenly legal and available under the new regime will belong to them and not someone else. 
And yet, uh, as, I, I have to come from a very practical point of view because I actually treat patients. And um, Reverend Kylie and Professor Obugo are are are, are um, going at this. I think from a, a sort of thirty thousand feet in the air um, a theoretical viewpoint. And I I, ha I look at people who uh, live real lives and who often are looking to the physician for the answer. And the most demoralizing thing for that individual may well be, well, you know, yeah, your life really isn't worth living as it is right now, and, and you really should commit suicide, but fortunately there's a, there's a law that allows me to do that for you right now. There are many physicians who simply say, no, that's not going to be me, because at a practical level we've seen how unnecessary this is. We can give symptom control we can put people to sleep now with something wonderful called dexmedetomidine, which, which gives you a deep sleep without suppressing respiration. So you can say, why don't you have a rest for a couple of days, and then when we wake you up, you can discuss how you are feeling about this. And one of the, one of the most elemental confusions, which is really hard to, to, uh, to clear up in the public, is that disconnecting a ventilator is the same thing as, as violating the, the Hippocratic Oath not to kill. To, to simply, it, it's really important, although it is, it is subtle, that the general public start to grab hold of the idea that to foresee the outcome of stepping away from, from trying to cure, to foresee that the outcome is that the person may die sooner, who knows, they might not, might not because really good pain relief could help them to live longer, is not the same as to intend that they die within a certain time frame, to intend to kill. The entire criminal law, of course, uh, as, as uh, Professor Ob Obogu could, could say, uh, could, 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 could corroborate, is based on the distinction between intent and lack of intent. And to suddenly say we can, we can pluck that out of the situation now makes no sense. And it, it's, it, we're not talking about abandoning the patient here. I think the ultimate in, in abandoning the patient is to say, a, there's nothing I can do, and B, I can kill you. That's abandonment. The real abandonment is saying, here's some suicide pills, away you go. Do what you want. Be an autonomous individual. To me, that's abandonment. I never abandon my patients who are at the end of life, and I've had a very small number say, doctor, can't you do, can't you do something? Can't you, can't you just put me to sleep right now? And I know what they're asking. They're asking for better symptom control, and in many cases, they're asking not to be conscious. It is ethical. It is available right now to do palliative sedation. This is not intentional killing. This is preserving a safe space in our, in our culture, in our society. And, and it's, um, it's alarming to me to, to have someone of the obvious humanity of Professor Obogu saying that, that um, we can dispense with the conscience rights of physicians. The conscience rights aren't there for the, for the, for because of some sort of obscure um, spiritual peccadillo of the individual physician. Conscience rights are there to serve the public so that they can have access to institutions and, and, and uh, physicians who will only do what they think is right. To say, um, well, if you're going to make an omelet, you've got to break a few eggs. You know, if you're going to be a doctor, you're going to uh, you're gonna have to kind of um, uh, pony up some, some, uh, some really distasteful actions, including killing people even that you don't want to kill, or referring for them, which is, which is obviously morally objectionable. But fortunately, when the law is made, I suspect that cooler heads will prevail. I mean, what do we do now with, with abortion? Uh, there is no problem with access to abortion. Women can form an abortion clinic. Uh, women can, uh, there, there truly is no, uh, no problem. And I can tell you that practicing for 35 years. So there is not going to be a problem for access. Look, look at Ellen Weeb's hemlockaid.org. Hemlockaid.org. You'll see both a, a, a very entertainingly macabre logo of a, a black crow perching on a bent branch and you will see an invitation to come on down. We're open for business. And she was the woman who killed the Calgary woman, which I, I, don't, I, I think that was a publicity stunt almost. I mean, was the woman in a rush to get to Vancouver because she might die before she could be killed? Um, this, this is very disturbing to me, and, and I, I think that uh, there will not be access problems routinely as well. We transfer people. So to talk about having to basically chase a denomination, I'm not a Catholic, but to talk about having to chase a denominational uh, organizational structure out of health care when th many of those, those uh, palliative care beds were set up in the absence of any real public enthusiasm by that very same denomination. To, and to talk about chasing them out because they won't, they won't violate what the World Health Organization calls the central precept of palliative care, that they, the palliative care physicians will neither strive to hasten nor prolong a life.
Dr. Johnson, we're going to move on to the next question here. Uh, <laughs> Hello. Is this on? In the upcoming um, legal framework, if all of the legal check boxes have been checked off for a physician assu assisted death, uh, will there be legal recourse if there is suspicion of wrongful death? Thank you for that question. I, I think that's a really key uh, issue. And uh, presently, we actually need to invent something new. Uh, wrongful death in Canada will have legal consequences, however it arises. Uh, it, will, it will have both civil and criminal consequences. Uh, and so I don't think we need to invent something new here. If there's any suspicion of undue influence of duress or any of those things, that will normally attract uh, legal consequences. But what we want is to create policy that prevents that from happening in the first place. Nobody wants to have um, a wrongful death issue, which then becomes a story. You know, the press picks up on it, and it becomes the story, and then there's setbacks for patients who actually uh, will want to exercise this option. It also will create fear and, and distrust. Uh, and I think what we need to do is to build something from the ground up that actually prevents that from happening. Now, part of doing that is to think sensibly about how to structure it. Again, to stop with all the noise and focus on what the Supreme Court has said is legal and how do we make that thing that is legal to work as best as possible. The way to do that is to think sensibly about access, is to make sure that those who are willing and trained and qualified to do this are the ones who are in charge of it. Um, the, the criteria that Brian set out, uh, where you have physicians review the, the request, where you have the request uh, uh, investigated, where you ensure that persons who may have some influence on the, on the patient are not present in the decision making process, provides as close as possible as you're going to get um, some comfort, at least from my perspective. Uh, and I, I think if you do things along those lines, and you also have people who review uh, what the decisions that have been made, and you have transparency as well, right? You might end up with something that doesn't lead to that, which is why I also think we need to start small. But you know, to answer your question more directly, we have laws already that deal with wrongful death. And what I really want to emphasize here is that there is nothing new about this issue. It is not the issue that our society has never dealt with before. We've dealt with this before in some other form on some other issue, and we've come up with ways to deal with issues like this. Thank you. David? Yeah, my question was actually about wrongful death as well, but it's a little bit different emphasis. Um, my understanding anyway is that with the tort of wrongful death, that consent is not a defense because you can't consent to your own death under the common law. And I don't see the Supreme Court ruling changing tort law, only criminal law. So I guess my question is, if even if it's not a crime anymore, couldn't even if the patient consented, couldn't that doctor still be sued successfully in tort for wrongful death? And uh, wouldn't that kind of deter doctors from doing that, I guess, if it's uh, because consent is still not a defense in, in tort for wrongful death, as far as I know? Do I know if you want to take that question? No, no, that's yours. So I'm a tough professor, and uh, that's a tough one. David, you're going to have to bring it to class. Um, the short answer is no. Um, wrongful death, um, as a concept, I'm trying to explain this as much as, uh, as a, it's a tough question to explain to a, a non-law audience. Uh, but, but the thought of wrongful death, you have to establish the thought first. Right? And then you then say, well, the fact that someone consented to it is no, is no defense. Right? But the thought of wrongful death, the wrongful is important. The wrongful is important. If the law provides for a process where somebody takes their own life, right, with assistance from someone else, that will not, by definition, amount to wrongful death. If you do something to compromise the person's consent or to go against what the law provides, then yes, you end up with a wrongful death scenario, but you've done something wrongful. So the emphasis is on the wrongful. If physicians provide assistance with dying, that would not meet the definition of wrongful death as a tort. Um, okay. I'm not a 
I'm not a law professor, but I'm going to take a stab at something here. And that is, I think the general public can understand that attempting suicide is not illegal. So when the law is changed, um, the reason it's being changed, the, the purpose of the change of the law is to, not to protect patients. The purpose is to protect healthcare institutions and physicians and, and um, everyone else who's being proposed to, to potentially assist suicides or kill patients under the supervision of, of a physician from some sort of legal recourse. So people think that they're acquiring a new right when in reality they're simply um, acquiring a new danger from, from the public system in my view. And I, again, I say this because on balance it's unnecessary. The, the same, everything that is being asked by the, the suicidal person, that is the person who wants to die, and I'm using the word suicidal because I think that euphemism is the, is the biggest threat to public clarity here, um, but uh, every, everything that the suicidal person wants can be supplied by conventional, legal, ethical, currently available palliative care. Currently available not enough, but as, as you so correctly pointed out, um, we need to get the fire under palliative care provision. If, we were, if this was a seminar on palliative care, you're absolutely right. I, I, I'm wondering about the one person that, uh, that might be you were no, suggesting. You and, <laughs> and so, and so um, given that, all, that what the law, to, to make this available to Canadians, the law has to be changed to protect institutions and physicians from legal recourse. And, and that needs to be borne in mind. That's, that's essentially what the exercise is going to be all about. Do it this way and you can't get sued. Um, you know, in, in, in Belgium, physicians do the craziest stuff and they, 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 they never, never, nothing ever happens. You know, it, it, it becomes part of the, uh, the wallpaper, part of the medical culture, and that's, that's what I, I think we need to watch out for. Okay. I um, can't over. let this one go. I'll be very brief. Um, and, and I just have to respond to the good doctor and say, um, the idea that the law is being changed only to protect physicians uh, is a great stretching of the truth. Um, this is about giving people reliable access to medication that will help them die and not leaving it in their own hands so that emergency room physicians are dealing with people who have had botched suicides of which there are many, many numbers. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to try and keep this concise even though it's a little bit of a convoluted question. Um, I, I'd like to thank uh, Reverend Kelly for uh, putting the individual at the center of uh, uh, his considerations and, and dismissing a very broad sort of slippery slope argument. But as a counterpoint to that, uh, I, I, I'd like to ask about how uh, competence, you know, that uh, th this uh, the the primary defense you're um, employing against the this slippery slope argument was that we're relying on competent individuals. Um, now I uh, work with uh, people with uh, developmental disabilities and. Within that community, this is a hugely sensitive issue. Uh, the Latimer case, among others, you know, it's it's a hugely sensitive sensitive issue. But at, at, at the and it's clear that if you're going to say, well, it's only going to be you know competent adult individuals, that there's not going to be another trace in Latimer. That's not going to happen un under this legislation. I guess getting to getting to my point, getting to my question is, it's going to be tested. What happens when someone you know, with uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, uh, uh, excuse me, spectrum diagnosis or an autism spectrum diagnosis, what happens when they start demanding the same right uh, to request this that I would have in the same position with the same advanced cancer or whatever it is? Uh, I guess how would we respond to the inevitable pressures of people who, you know, we're not currently deeming competent saying, well, where is my right? Um, great question, uh, one of deep concern, and the first thing I'd say, you brought up the Latimer case, and one of the things I would mention is that when that tragic case was happening, uh, the people on my side of the fence who are advocates for choice in dying um, staunchly resisted supporting Mr. Latimer, and he did what he did, fully aware that he was breaking the law, and that was the situation. Um, 
Yeah, I suspect that there will be, as, as uh, the professor was suggesting, there will be opportunities, there will be tests to try and expand this very narrow definition of the Supreme Court. Um, and my guess is that's where it'll go back to, is the court, when those times come. Go ahead. So I, I also think that's a, it's a fantastic question. Um, as, I, as I mentioned before, I think inevitably we're going to see request for an expansion. Now, it, this is also the point to stress how unique this country is and how unique our constitution is. Just because you have a right doesn't mean that that right can always be expressed because you have it. We do have a constitution and a charter of rights and freedoms that says that your rights have to be balanced against uh, what it takes to create a good country that can be governed as a democratic, a liberal democratic state. So I think as this request come up, and I personally would like to see more of this request come up. I, I have uh, given media interviews where I've spoken about the need to consider that there might be a minor who has capacity, who is in exactly the same situation as uh, the, 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 the individual in, in the CADA decision, right? So uh, it seems to be sort of a logical, something like logical about saying a minor who can consent and who's in exactly the same situation should not gain access when an adult, all it takes between, the difference between a minor and an adult is one day, right? So I think those challenges are gonna come. But we have a Supreme Court that will say, based on where we are right now, based on all the factors, all the evidence before them, all the things that have been presented, this is what we think will balance everyone's interest in this country's in this country, and if, if it turns out that it's against the right of, if the, of the person who wants to expand it, then so be it, we accept that until such a time when we're comfortable. Remember, the first time the Supreme Court handled this was in 1993, and they said no. And they kept saying no until 2015, right? So that's important. It's important because these expansions don't happen overnight. They take a long time. We're not that country. We're not Belgium. Uh, I, would, I would say that these expansions are inevitable. We have to remember that the Supreme Court sort of handed an impossible task to Parliament. They said that uh, you would qualify if you were subjectively distressed enough and if you subjectively didn't want to go on with therapy for your, your illness. And the seriousness of the illness is your call. So against that open book, they then admonished Parliament to circumscribe this new right very tightly. These are contradictory directions to Parliament. I have no doubt that uh, good lawyers like Dr. Obugu and, uh, and uh, Joe Arve, who, who argued the Carter case, will have great success in expanding this. So that, so that I think that um, what uh, really, what the guidelines or what the supposed restrictions in law are, are is really just a kind of a thermometer for how alarmed people are at the risks that this will expand. These guidelines themselves will fall like nine pins one by one. Uh, and I, I would make a plea if I was in front of the people drafting this law right now to put some sort of judicial review, put, put Professor Ogbogu in front of um, the, the representative of the person asking for this on an expedited basis. Do not trust two physicians chosen at random from the population, many of whom will have advertised themselves as willing to be very uh, friendly towards requests for suicide to determine who is going to die here. Uh, the, the determination of, of uh, voluntariness and vulnerability founders on four points that, that I didn't mention during my talk. The first is the inherent difficulty of knowing what is going on at home and in the personal life of the applicant for assisted suicide or euthanasia. The second is the pressure of medical work and the tendency for regulatory requirements to be abbreviated into casual routines and empty rituals. The third is the fact that the physician competence to determine depression, capacity, voluntariness, and influence is very uh, poorly distributed and subject to bias and is unlikely to change in the near future. And the fourth is the very persistent public misapprehension of the capabilities and purposes of palliative care and intentional partisan obfuscation of the real distinction between refusing treatment, um, comfort care, cessation of life-sustaining treatment, assisted suicide, and euthanasia. 
I find it interesting that a physician says, don't trust a physician. Yeah. You, you should listen. So, I, I mean, I, I think this is an argument that, um, I mean, it's an argument I use against my wife all the time. Um, <laughs> when, when she says, oh, this is not about law, I'm like, you don't understand, you're not a lawyer, right? Um, I'm not a doctor, but I've been studying issues around what doctors do for a very long time, and I think it's, it's um, not quite correct to say that I don't understand what goes on in practice. I, I, I served on the Clinical Ethics Committee here at the University of Alberta uh, Hospital. Doctors come with all these issues all the time. I'm very familiar with the struggles that they have on the ground. I, I'm, very, I'm very familiar with how deeply they care about these issues. I think it is deeply distrustful of doctors to say that they take these matters very lightly and they just, you know, uh, default to routines. That's not what happens. Uh, when, I, when I worked at the Clinical Ethics Committee, I've seen doctors cry for issues that don't actually uh, concern them personally, just professional issues about care, and they break down and cry because it's difficult for them to deal with, and they're trying to find a way around it. As a lawyer in the room, I will usually say, the law is clear, and then everyone will proceed to ignore me. <laughs> I have never succeeded when I was at the Clinical Ethics Committee in getting them to actually follow the law unless it is consistent with their view of what the ethical rule should be. I think this deep distrust of doctors really need to, you know, be, there needs to be some caution around that. I'm not saying there are no bad, bad doctors. History has shown that. But there's also a ton of good doctors around the country who care about consent, who care about their patients, and we can't, you know, just paint all of them with one brush. Please do not, do not assume that I am painting every doctor with his brush. What I am saying is that if the, all of the expense and time of a capital murder trial does not always prevent a wrongful death, then we, we have to recognize that the best screened candidates for this, these procedures that this country is ever going to see may well be those poster cases for assisted death that, that were in, in before the courts. Because they were scrutinized by the media, they came forward voluntarily, they were, worked closely with civil liberties lawyers. The, the, chance, the, the chances of, of, uh, of, of uh, improper inducement or, or of uh, undue influence, although not zero, are probably very low. Sadly, this is just not going to be what happens if the volume of deaths that, that uh, the people willing to do it, like Ellen Weeb, are predicting starts to happen. That's, that's what I'm saying. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. My name is Elizabeth Ballerman. I uh, represent, I'm the president of the Health Sciences Association of Alberta, which represents about 24,000 health professionals, some of whom would participate in some, whether paramedics or pharmacists, etc. cetera. Um, whatever my personal views, and they're strong, and I won't bore you with the story. The One of the questions we have, I think our membership isn't different than other Canadians as far as their level of support for this, as we're trying to formulate whether we should even take a position on this question. Um, the important issue for me and the people that I represent includes protecting them, which I think is covered by just making a, a legal uh, framework, but also in caring for the people who are prepared to provide the service, because inevitably I think we are going to see some challenges as, as they deal with the difficulty, the, the social approbation the, and, and the personal things. I, I've sp personally spoken to a physician who's assisted in harvesting organs, for example clearly someone who was going to die, but telling me about the nightmares the night after participating in that. And so the caution I just want to throw out, more so than the question, I know we're supposed to do questions, but we also will have to take care of the people who have the courage to provide the service when it is, uh, cre uh, when it is uh, there. Thank you. Thank you, and yep. I spoke a while ago about a colleague who is in the Netherlands who has assisted, who has been the spiritual advisor at a couple of deaths. And the other part that she told me uh, is that she had to take at least one to two days off work after that afterwards because death is not easy. Killing people is not easy. Helping people to die, even if it is their fondest wish, is not something people take lightly. And that's why. I certainly won't dismiss that there will be 
a physician somewhere in the country who wants to just be a killer for hire, but I think that will be very, very, very rare. And I say that with the same conviction Dr. Johnston posits that I am wrong. So I, I would also um, applaud that comment. I, I think it's absolutely, absolutely crucial that we also get that right. Uh, and that's why I would like to see some of the noise around the ethics go away. And we can then work on the framework that we have right now and how to make it work really well. Uh, and people keep talking about physician-assisted death. I think we're going to have other healthcare providers participate. In the, the, just last month, uh, the BC, the College of Pharmacists in British Columbia put out a statement very briefly saying their members should not do anything with respect to this. Right, uh, because they, they might face legal consequences. They wanted to have a clear legal framework first before they participate. And I know from teaching in the School of Pharmacy and from talking to people that people worry about things like this. You know, you dispense the medication and then you go back and you worry about it. There needs to be support for healthcare professionals who work in this area. What we've seen in the abortion context is that people who do this kind of work are under siege and sometimes at a risk to their own person. There needs to be a focus on that. And we're not going to focus on that if we keep debating things that are no longer relevant for the purposes of moving forward. And I think that's what we need to do right now, is to focus on how this might bring about challenges to our healthcare system and address them through clear policies and clear support guidelines. Well, I'm, I'm clearly only interested in, in what we can do now. The past is the past. Uh, and my concern is, is, as I say, the public safety issues and in harm reduction. I, I think that um, if someone has to take two days off after participating in this, um, this is a recognition that these are, uh, that moral intuition is telling people that there's something deeply, deeply troubling here. I didn't say wrong. I'm not saying that these people are intentionally doing something wrong. And in fact, I know that Dr. Weeb, for instance, is a person of, of great altruism who is doing this out of a, out of a sense of, of uh, a mission, a higher purpose. However, it is also true that people who are doing things altruistically and who do not doubt their own beneficence can sometimes lose sight of things and become far too welcoming to the procedure that they are, that they are um, providing, especially when they're providing it with, against some criticism. So, so I would say that if we recognize that there is a deeply troubling moral intuition at work here, we should not be cavalier by saying that people have just got to belly up and make that referral and make sure that it's an effective referral in the, in the words of the Ontario College, those words now having occasioned a lawsuit which is now underway. Because there are a lot of people who will simply say, I became a doctor to exert, to, be, to exert on behalf of my patient professional judgment. When my professional judgment says that this is the wrong thing to do, I'm hoping that we will all have the courtesy to each other to not insist that anyone do for the patient what they consider to be wrong. And as I say, I think cooler heads will prevail and that a, 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 an easy method of central uh, self-referral into, into a system to be considered, not, not, not a trap door into, into an assisted suicide, I would hope, but a, but a, a rational system of the sort that, that the professor is, is talking about uh, will, will eventually happen. Now, I, I think that um, there will be people whose lives are cut short unnecessarily and who throw away years of their lives through fear, especially horror of disability. But um, I, I think that we can work together to minimize the, the, uh, the damage here. Okay, I'm just looking at the time, and we are actually at 7 o'clock. So uh, in, in, in consideration of, of the people who have stood up, and are you still wanting to ask a question? Okay. All right, thank you. So one question. Quick last question. I just, and I just have two quick questions. Um, I just want to ask, do you guys think that the lack of palliative care available in Canada is partially responsible for the support of assisted suicide in Canada? And do you also think that assist, since assisted suicide is now becoming legal, um, that it will de decrease the incentive and the pressure on government to make palliative care access more available? Yes to the first question. Um, it's long been a case, and I mean, I can remember when palliative care was not an accepted medical discipline in Canada. Um, it's not going back that many decades to remember when that was not acceptable. There clearly isn't enough care, and 
Um, I often tell the story of my mother, who died 24 years ago, who came to me knowing, the, knowing my act, that I was active. She had a cancer diagnosis, and she said, would you please take care of me if I need it, meaning find a way to kill her. And I knew it was completely against the law, and so on and so forth. And I said, yes, Mom, I will, because like, she's my mother, right? And, uh, but the thing that I also trusted, she was a very good religious Catholic woman, um, was that all she wanted to do was to have someone, to have the safe knowledge that if it got too bad, she had a way out. And in fact, she had a beautiful death in a palliative care facility in a hospital. Um, good palliative care will certainly drop the number of people requesting assisted suicide, but it will not remove it entirely. I disagree with John, Dr. Johnston there. I'm not sure how many beers it's going to take before Brian and I can uh, agree on something. <laughs> <laughs> But we should try sometime. Um, I, I, I would say that no, uh, the lack of palliative care is not, to, if you listen to actually people in your own organization, that is, that is not what they're talking about. They're talking about autonomy. They're talking about people who say, I want my death to reflect the independence with which I've lived my life. This is what's driving this, this whole thing, is autonomy. And, um, and no, sadly, I, I think that although I hope we'll all work together and in, improve the access to palliative care, the demand for assisted suicide and euthanasia is likely to rise for several internal reasons that I will not uh, go into right now. So since I'm supposed to be the, uh, the, the middle ground, uh, which is not, I don't know why I was asked to do that. I, it's not my natural position. I, Don't worry, you're not. I feel like I've constrained <laughs> myself. Okay, thank you. Oh. Oh. Yes. Um, but I will say it's, it's not one or the other. All of this, these matters are too complex to reduce it to it's, we can blame palliative care or not. I think all of these factors do contribute. Uh, and it's a complex story. And palliative care or the lack of it does have an impact uh, on this. But I also think that autonomy and choice is also compromised there. As someone who has thought about this, I actually don't want to be in the position that's described by the Supreme Court before I take this option. I, I actually have a rather extreme view about this. And I'm somebody who is very rational, I hope so, uh, and who has thought about this. And there are people like me everywhere who make different kinds of choices. And the only question is, what kind of choices would our society allow us to make? And I think it's important to focus on that and think about the individuals involved in this. Uh, it's not an easy question for anyone, no matter how cavalier you are about death. And, and I think to reduce it to one perspective or the other, perhaps, is not the way to go. Thank you. If I can say one more thing about autonomy. Um, I love autonomy. I'm, I'm one of those people who doesn't like other people to tell me what to do. And I think we've all got a lot of that. My red flag, my tiny little red flag that I'm waving here is, you're expecting that this is going to increase your autonomy. I would say, look twice, be careful, look at what goes on. Uh, this is not necessarily the outcome of all of this. Well, the flag um, is not tiny. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness, that is an excellent way to end the evening on this very speculative note, big flag, small flag. I, I want to thank you, all three of you, for having the courage to uh, stand up and really express your very strong points of view on this very complex issue, and for agreeing to disagree, and lastly, for agreeing to be present this evening, because I think all of us have learned a great deal just listening to you. So uh, would you join me in thanking our panelists?